the drum, as you may no doubt know. Well, I was asked to do the Phil Seaman story, which I didn't mind at all, because being an egomaniac, it pleased me greatly. Therefore, here I am. I started playing the drums approximately six years of age. One of my vivid memories is this, that my mother and father fixed up an audition with a gentleman by the name of Jack Payne, believe it or not. And they took me along to Derby, to the theatre there. And then when we got down to the entrance, after the first house, for me to go along to see Jack Payne, I chicking out and cried my fucking eyes out. Now, at eight years of age, I was bought what was known as a Heinz kit. 59 different varieties or 49 different varieties. That's like one sort of tom-tom, one sort of snare drum, one sort of bass drum, etc., etc. But right now I have a kit which is a kit. I'd like to play it for you so you can hear what it sounds like. At the age of 14, I joined what's laughingly known as a semi-professional band, Len Reynolds and his Metro Dance Orchestra. Can you imagine a name like that? I mean, you hear the who and the what and the why and the wherefore, but Len Reynolds' Metro Dance Orchestra, that's a load of rubbish. <laughs> I had the the honour of playing, believe it or not, two timpanis with two pieces of cardboard. And I used to play brushes on the cardboard. It sounded, oh really, I, I can't describe it. I could, but I won't be so vile. But this was my first gig, dressed up there looking like something out of the black and white minstrel show. It was a joke. And, I may add, the price for this gig was seven shillings and sixpence. <laughs> Never mind about less stamps or tax or anything like that. Just straight seven and sixpence, no chaser. And then, with this charming orchestra, we used to do the Mers Ball, the Mayor, M-A-Y-R-O-S the mayor's ball 
This was the yearly gig in my hometown, wherein everybody was knocked out. We got a supper, a cold salad with the lettuce curling at the edges, which was lovely, and 12 shillings and sixpence, believe it or not, 12 and six. Now, Len Reynolds, he said, all you're here for is to play time. Now, time, people, is this. That's time. And believe you me, I've played enough of it to stretch from here, well, from Land's End to John O'Groats. As a matter of fact, I used to practice to records. I used to have the front windows open and wait until someone was coming down the street. And then I would put on my favorite record, which could be anything from uh, the Benny Goodman recording of Sing, 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 or Count Bases, Clap Hands, Here Comes Charlie, some of Jimmy Lunsford's, and then I would start by playing this sort of thing. so on. Well then, at the age of 18, I turned professional and I joined Nat Ginella's band. Well now, Nat was a marvel. He is the greatest guy. He was a father to me because, well, he looked after me, you know. Ten days before I joined the business, I went out and bought a drum tutor to learn how to read. Nat used to make me stay behind after the band rehearsal and practice my parts. And if you think I'm lying when I say to you, if I made a mistake, I got a clip round the ear hole, then you're off your tiny little head because I used to get a clip round the ear hole. Sharp and swift because Nat wouldn't stand for it. We used to get Tommy Dorsey arrangements, which had the Buddy Rich drum solos written out. And believe you me, if you've ever seen a Buddy Rich drum solo, it looks like fly shit. And uh, that's not very nice at all. The guys in the band, which I think deserve a mention, were Johnny Rogers on alto, Kenny Graham on tenor saxophone, Roy Plummer on guitar, Lenny Bush on bass, Al Dalloway on piano, and we had a singer, the <laughs> best plater in the business. <laughs> Get away with that one if you can. <laughs> Really, I'm not kidding, that chick was too much. She wound up marrying some GI officer, which is a right fucking liberty. Her mother, of course, was an RC, Roman Catholic, you know. And uh, she didn't believe in this girl, you know, giving you uh, one off the old... Uh, John Thomas MacDangle. But nevertheless, she was a darling. And I had the sorest pair of balls you've ever known. 
Now, you see, Nat Canella, he was what's known as a punter. A punter is a man who, when he gets any money, <laughs> he does it. Jesus Christ, he does it. He spends it all on the GGs. So you would get two weeks notice without so much as by your leave. You know, you just said, well, I'll let you know when you're employed again. Like a silly bastard that I was, I used to say, okay, you know. Everybody did because we loved him so much. In fact, we had the first bebop band. I don't know if you know what bebop is. But bebop was created by Bird. Bird meaning Charlie Parker. And you see, Charlie Parker was a genius. He put something down that no one had ever attempted before. Because, for instance, if one plays Salt Peanuts, because if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to play it for you. And if you don't know the melody, unlucky. Just call me up for something, you know. And I'm not going to sing it because my pitching is diabolical. There's an eight bar introduction, then you go into the melody, okay? Well now, in between joining Nat Ganella and uh, other gigs, I had what we call a gay gig. And I worked with a band called Johnny Smith and his out <laughs> the Blue Orchestra. <laughs> it's the truth, I swear to Christ. I mean, nobody but an idiot would have a name like Johnny Smith and his out of the Blue Orchestra. He is now selling water softeners or some rubbish. Anyway, I was his band, you see, in South Sea, the Savoy Ballroom, and they used to have three name bands a night in those days. I used to live around the corner from the ballroom, and I also had a chick whose mother kept a pub. <laughs> which came in very handy, I must confess. Well, now, it used to be what was known then as a quick step and a slow fox drop, another quick step, which was a set, like four sets of three. Then there'd be the waltz. Well, by the time we got to the waltz, I personally had had enough and uh, proceeded back to my lodgings with my chick for you know what. Right? Good. Well now, I'm in the middle of you know what, when all of a sudden there's on the door and I thought, Jesus Christ, seaman, you've got to get another place to live. But no, I opened the door and there's this owl with two legs which turned out to be Tommy Sampson and he said would you do the second half with my band and I said whoa yeah all right if it's all right with the band leader and the manager etc you know you've got to go through protocol and KGB and all that crap so that's how I came to join Tommy Sampson's band which is 1948 but believe you me, we had the biggest bunch of maniacs in that band you've ever laid eyes on. I mean, there's Johnny Hawksworth. I mean, Johnny Hawksworth was born potty. 
I'm sure. I don't mean potty you sit on or potty you smoky. Potty, nutty, you dig? Right. Hawksworth was a complete nutter because he thought of things which I swear to God that Jesus Christ never thought of. But we had a good band, six trumpets, four trombones, five saxes and four rhythm. And believe you me, that's what's known as a powerhouse band. And the Samson band, to my knowledge to this day, is now resident at the City Hall, Perth. And Pat Smythe, as a matter of fact, said to me, do you know that Tommy Samson is playing New Year's Eve at the City Hall at Perth? Well, the last time I heard of Tommy Samson, he got thrown out of the Salvation Army. Paul Fenley's band was quite unique because it was the first band without a piano. And that was the happiest band, traveling-wise. When you're in a coach, day after day, traveling can be a drag. When you've got to go from, you know, Baker Street to Grimsby is uh, no fun. Paul Fenelay Band, which was three trumpets, three trombones, five saxes. Now, the five saxes, this points a very interesting part because, you see, my darts partner, who's now become a Jehovah's Witness, was Don Rendell. There was Bob Efford and there was Don Rendell. And Don Rendell was my darts partner. And I'll stand up in Bow Street Court in front of any magistrate you like. Don Rendell was my darts partner. So don't let that pass you by. The next band, after Paul Fenelay, was Joe Loss. Now, Joe was the greatest of them all because he treated guys as I consider musicians should be treated. And that is, if you've been sitting on your ass in a coach for 250 miles, when you get at the other end, you want to know that you've got good accommodation. Well, Joe Loss saw to it that every man had good accommodation. In fact, he made the most classic statement to me. He said, Phil, little boy, I prefer a gentleman to a musician. <laughs> well, I mean, if you like bebop, that's a load of cobblers. But nevertheless, Joe Loss was a beauty. He did prefer looking after his guys, and that he did. Now, I stayed with the band, oh, 14 months. Played in the mood three times a night, and an American patrol, Jesus. <laughs> I can assure you that is no, no turn on for anybody, because it's enough to make you top anybody. Then after that came Jack Parnell. Now that was something else. Of course, Jack Parnell was definitely Jack the Lad. You know, he'd been with Ted Span. So, big deal. Until I joined Jack's band, I'd never played a paradiddle in my life. In fact, I thought a paradiddle was some form of sexual, you know, orgasm or something horrid like that being the innocent I am <laughs> I had some lovely times like Hank Shaw I mean Hank is a sweet guy but he studies yoga well one of the theories of yoga is that if there's anybody or anything in the band who worries you you make out a list and set fire to it. 
and it will go from your head. Well, at the top of the list was Phil in the morning. Because I said to Hank, do me a favour, shut your mouth. Don't talk to me before midday. Because when you've been up all night, shall we say, uh, wailing, then you don't want to talk to anybody. In fact, you don't even talk to yourself. Don't mind about some trumpet player. But he always had to try his luck. So, every day he got a coat in. Hank may not like this, meaning Henry Shaw. But when we were with Jack's band, we arrived at the Winter Gardens and we see in the band room windows with catches open. So immediately everybody said, Hey Hank, get the sea air, get your clothes off. And before you know it, he's stark as. <laughs> well, as soon as he got out of the window, all the catches went click, 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 click. And Hank was locked out, the stupid bastard. What he did, instead of going to the left, he went to the right, where all the birds worked, all the typists. And the sight of a, a young Jewish gentleman walking along Starkers was rather horrific. Well, that's yoga. In 1953, we had a slight altercation caused by a female, namely one vocalist. It wouldn't have mattered if the man who replaced the guy she rode out of the band was better. But he wasn't. He was not better. He was a bloody sight worse. I personally took no chances and asked everyone in the band if they were going to quit. And everybody says, yeah. But came the dawn, <laughs> a load of shit, if I may be so crude. Because the odd man out was myself. Because that's when Ronnie formed his octet. He used Tony Crombie, Lenny Bush, Jimmy Duca, Ken Ray. Pete King, tenor player Pete King. Ronnie Scott led the band, of course. Benny Green, who is now a well-known uh, Chatsby, or whatever you want to call it, talker. Victor Fellman, yeah, there was nobody else.
see, one could carry on playing and playing and playing, but I've got a lot to tell you, so I must keep it short, because otherwise you get no hole in the middle of the record. <laughs>